everyone. Um, I'm back. Um, today, this video is going to be about more about me, my health, um, what I've been battling for many years that I haven't really spoken about too much publicly. I have been a little bit more recently. Um, the reason that I tried not to talk about it for the first four or five years that this was happening to me um, was because one, I didn't really understand it, and it's because it's difficult to understand, especially what's happening to you and your body. Um, and also because it is sad. It's sad. It's, it's very sad. And um, I'm the type of person that I, if something hurts me, I want it to stop there. I don't want to allow something that has hurt me to bleed onto everyone else. I don't think that that's fair. Um, my battle with my health, I feel like is very much my own. It's very complicated. And I don't want that to be what people think of when they think of me. I don't want my struggle to become my identity. And I feel like I should be allowed to choose that. Um, these conditions have taken everything from me, everything. And one of the reasons that this video is going to be so important before the next couple videos when we talk about more of the legal side of what happened is because it played a big role. It played, my illnesses certainly did play a role in getting to where I was in a situation where people were very able to take advantage and where I was in a situation where it was very difficult for me to fight back against the things that were being said about me. Um, it was all very confusing and it, it was incredibly traumatic when all of that was happening. But I've gotten, I mean, for years, I've gotten interesting comments. I try to be very understanding of um, other people who don't understand what I'm going through because it is difficult to understand. It was difficult for me to understand and accept and it was happening to me. So I get it. The people don't get it. I understand that. Um, and I try to really be soft in that respect when I get interesting comments that are hurtful, but they're comments from ignorance. Um, and it's not like a chosen ignorance. It's like you wouldn't know. Like I can't blame people for not understanding because it's something that you wouldn't understand until it happens to you, until you deal with these internal weird wars with your own body. It's you. It's not an, as, as hard as you try, you can't. It's something you can't understand until you feel it, right? Um, it's really hard to put into words. So let's talk about it. Let's. I'm going to talk about disability and why I'm not on it. Um, I want to talk about my internal work ethic that nobody can see anymore because of this body that I'm trapped inside. Um, I want to talk a lot about gratitude, though. I think that's important. You should always be grateful. In any situation, you should be grateful for something. Find something to be grateful for. Um, okay, so... After my little girl was born, a few months later, I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Um, upon that diagnosis, I was put into pain management for a couple of years, which I got out of because it honestly caused a few more problems than what it was solving. And it ended up, for me, I felt like it was getting to be kind of dangerous. I don't know. And I'll make another video where I talk about that and um, pain management and all of that stuff. That was a whole different thing. Um, after I got out of pain management, I actually felt like I was dealing with my fiber symptoms very well. That was when I started going to school for coaching and, um, you know, all the therapy modalities that I'm certified in. That was when I really, you know, I, I knew that I had this fibromyalgia, but I, I wasn't going to let it stop me. I don't think we should let things stop us if we have any control over it. I was going to school. I started coaching. Um, after I got 
a lot of certifications. I you know, I made sure that I was very educated before beginning that job, a job that I loved and was good at. And you guys, I'm human, and I can't say that I'm good at a whole bunch of things, um, but I was good at that. And it made me feel good. Helping people makes, makes me feel good. And I loved it. I loved my career in coaching. I moved over to mental health. A couple years went by and I started to have this fatigue. A lot of people who have fibromyalgia have fatigue, really bad fatigue. So I kind of just chalked it up to that and was like, okay, well, this is going to be a fibro symptom that I'm going to have to overcome the way I've overcome the rest of them. Um, and when I say overcome, I don't mean that those symptoms went away. Like, I still feel fibro pain. There are still things that I have to do. It's still very important that I take my vitamins, that I stay very, very hydrated. I take, I have to take good care of my body because if it's already sick, you know, um, I don't really drink that much and if I do have a couple drinks it's usually just a couple drinks and if I have more and like my body doesn't tolerate that like it did in my 20s it doesn't end up good and I end up getting very sick um so I started getting tired and you know going and I was going to my doctor for fibro symptoms and other stuff fibro is weird it's cyclical um, some days it's horrible. Some days you feel fine. It's very like, it's unpredictable, completely just no stability there. But I, I was able to adapt somehow. Um, so I started going to my doctor for this crazy fatigue that I just couldn't. I mean, I could not stay awake. I was sleeping for days at a time, almost just getting up long enough to go to be able to go to the bathroom, get a glass of water, whatever. And then I'd be right back down. And I still have times, clusters of sometimes days where I'm very much strapped to bed. Um, yesterday, I was in bed most of the day, and I was feeling very useless and very worthless. I took a picture, um, and I posted it, and I saw this morning there were really just a lot of kind words under that photo. And I, and I want to get back, and I'm going to go back to that picture and reply to everyone because I really want to express my gratitude. I think that's just so important. And kind words mean a lot when you are so sick. I mean, they mean a lot. And especially in comparison to the a lot of the bullying that I've received just for something that I can't, I, I can't. I can't control my fatigue. <laughs> can't control when my body's awake. It's not like a normal wakefulness. So I go to the doctor and they say, okay, well, you have mono. They tested me, um, a blood test for a couple different things. You have mono. He says it's going to go away. Mono's supposed to go away. Your immune system should be able to fight that. And in a couple months, you get better, right? I was like, good. That's awesome. There's an answer. Well, that wasn't what happened. Um, my body did not get better. I still, that, I, I feel like that was back in like 2018 or 2019. And I still, it, it never went away. It only worsened. I still deal with clusters of those symptoms where I'm down for a couple days. And I can't move my body. It's too heavy. I lose my voice a lot. I used to have a beautiful singing voice that I do not have anymore. I cannot sing like I used to. My throat is all messed up. There are some days when I lose my voice entirely. I get unexplained fevers just out of freaking nowhere. Um, I have big, big problems with my hands and, and you'll see me clasp them. I didn't realize how much I clasped them until I was actually looking at one of the other videos I did and I'm like, I fuck with my hands a lot. Um, my hands go from being in a lot of pain to numb <laughs> so it's a big problem it's very debilitating I try to get through it try to smile through it like I've done with this these conditions since day one okay um, I I will smile as a courtesy to the people around me even if I'm hurting like I said I don't ever want my pain to hurt anyone else like I feel like it's my duty 
to deal with my own problems. Um, there are good days and bad days. And sometimes I can open my eyes and sometimes I can't. Um, and on those days, and it's worse in the winter. This winter has actually been a little bit better, I think. Um, but on those days, on the bad days, even the strongest of stimulants, I'll sleep right through them and miss out on life and miss out on memories. You know, I love being awake. <laughs> you know, I probably have a little bit more gratitude for my wakeful hours than most people because I don't get as many of them as most people. And it's really hard. It steals, it's stolen everything from me. Um, when I realized that I could not be there for my clients, my coaching clients, the way that they needed me to be there, and I had to stop doing that, it was absolutely devastating because I loved doing it so much, and I was so good at it, and I loved making those connections and helping those people. It was so important, um, and it made my heart feel good. It gave me purpose. And when I couldn't do that anymore, I felt like the biggest failure on the planet. And um, people say, well, that's, that's very altruistic that you want to help people. And if you don't know what altruism is, it, that term means when somebody does something for someone else without nothing, with getting nothing in return, usually to detriment of the person doing it. And people would say that about me when I was able to help people the way that I was. And I don't know, but I don't know how altruistic it was because it seemed like I wasn't getting anything from that, but that's not true. I was because it made me feel good and it made me feel like, okay, I made this person's life a little easier. I made this person's day a little better. And, you know, I, and to be able to do that for people. You can't put a price on that. In my heart, you can't. I know that a lot of people don't think that way, but I do. So I've been dealing with all of this for many years. Um, and it has taken me down. And what's crazy is, I mean, there's a lot of crazy stuff that happened. But you think when people get sick their families will kind of rally around them as families should and try to lift them up that was not what I experienced um, especially from Josh I there were nights I would cry myself to sleep just like cry myself to sleep because that day had passed and I missed it no matter how hard I tried, or how many stimulants I took, you know, and you get weird ignorant comments. Like, I remember having a conversation with one of my friends, and he's like, oh, you're tired too. Okay, well, it's not the same. We've all gotten tired since the day we were born. Babies sleep all the time. Um, and I feel like being branded as lazy when this isn't a behavioral problem, when I, when it's literally like, I want this so bad, something you want so bad. And everybody's like, just grab it. Just reach out and grab it, right? And they don't see that your hands are tied by invisible ropes and you can't. And it is a mind fuck of all mind fucks. Like, I don't know how else to explain that. The fact that my body is so different than the fighting spirit that's inside me. Um, I love working always. I've always loved working. I love being a part of a team. I love that camaraderie. I love having a purpose. I love being useful, bringing, bringing home money to support my family. That always makes you feel good. I love it. I'm a people person. I love that. I, you guys, I, my first job was at Chick-fil-A at 15 years old under a work permit that I got from the courts that my mom signed for me because I wanted to work. 
and throughout my teen years and throughout my 20s until I started getting real sick. There were times when I was bartending um, and nannying at the same time. I worked at a dental office when I was 19 and worked at, a, at the Raven at nighttime um, while my fiance was overseas at the time. I love working. I have an, an amazing work ethic. And it feels like this body, these conditions have completely stolen that among so many other things from me. And it's that it's it's heartbreaking, it's devastating. And it took so many years to accept that. And um, there were times when I'm crying myself to sleep. The next day I wake up to my husband who had moved out after he left calling me lazy and a leech and worthless and a horrible mother after I had cried myself to sleep the night before because I missed that entire day. Like people don't understand. I, I understand how frustrating it can be to live with someone who's sick or be even in friendship with someone who's so sick. I get that because even if that person's not unreliable, their health is unreliable, which makes them seem unreliable. I can promise you that it hurts the sick person I, a million, a billion times more than anybody else, okay? Um, I've missed out on so much of my own life. And at right as of right now, there is no cure for what's happening to me that I have been exposed to at least. I mean, whether there is a medical cure somewhere in the world is, who knows? I don't know. Um, but it's been challenging. And it's, it took everything. My health took everything from me before they used my health against me to take everything else from me. And that's, um, it's, it's a hard pill to swallow. It is. Um, I promise you that I'm not lazy. I mean, I'm a smart girl. I think it's so interesting when people are like, and, and when we get into the court documents, you'll see where they say that, I, that I'm faking conditions, which is weird because I've literally 13 years of medical record proving that I'm not faking anything. Um, the court, and nor did my attorney ever ask me for those records. She didn't even acknowledge any of the lies told about them. We'll get into that too. Um, but it's like, nobody would fake this, you guys. It's horrible. It's, it's horrible. It's devastating. I'm a smart girl. And I have been mostly bullied. I wouldn't say so much online. I think, although to be fair, a lot of my bullies online are blocked. So I don't know. But I have been so bullied over something that I have no control over. And that has already taken so much from me. I have such a weird relationship with my body. I hate my body, not for reasons that you can see on the outside. I don't hate my body for anything you can see. I hate my body because I feel like I'm stuck in here. So much good I could do in the world on days that if I could just move. I mean, I don't even get a shower every day. Like. It's a lot, it's a lot. And I feel like I've adapted, I've coped pretty well. Um, but I'm, I'm very resilient and I know there are a lot of people who are also suffering from chronic illness, whether it be rheumatoid problems or viral problems like I have, um, that get bullied. And I was never bullied as a child. I can't, I don't remember that happening to me. Maybe here and there, like, kids say mean things, you know, but bullying wasn't, wasn't an issue that I dealt with as a young person. And I can't imagine what those kids go through, having to deal with it as a grown-ass woman, as hard as it's been. Um, it just, it, it breaks my heart. So, I love working. And now, when we talk about, and I want to talk about the disability situation, because I've also heard... People say, well, if you were really disabled, you'd be on disability. Okay, well, let's talk about disability for, for just a minute. First of all, disability is not, even if you are truly disabled, usually unless you have literally lost a limb 
or have a terminal illness, disability is is always unapproved the first time you have to keep reapplying. And they do that to weed out people who don't really need it, okay? Um, when I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia and mono, all of it and all of these crazy things, I was married to an active duty military member. I already had health insurance through TRICARE. We didn't pay for our prescriptions or anything. Um, and furthermore, he was not only getting paid just to be married, because that's how military works, that's how military pay works. Soldiers will get paid more when they're married, and depending on how many dependents they have. And he had me, Deacon, who wasn't his son, but he was my husband, so. Um, Deacon was one of his dependents. So, so we were already being compensated and the way the military works it's supposed to be enough for the spouse to stay home for when the soldier is deployed a military income is supposed when you are married is supposed to be enough to support you your spouse and whatever children are in that home and there is a very very good reason for that it is because if daddy's gone for six months it's very important that mom doesn't have all of this other work so that they can be home not only to support the children who are separated from their one parent emotionally because that's difficult for a child. Um, it's difficult for adults to be separated that long even and to be able to take care of that home. So we were already getting compensated for me. It wasn't like a regular situation where the spouse has a job and then this spouse, you know, it's usually, it needs to be a two income family. But in reality, because soldiers are sent away for months at a time, sometimes longer, sometimes a year at a time, it's important that the other spouse can stay home to take care of those children and be all there for them and not have to think about, you know, doing another job. So we were already making money and there were other benefits because Josh was stationed in San Diego back in, I wanna say it's 2016, 2015, it was 15, 16, 17, one of those years. He actually got orders to go to San, we got orders to go to San Diego, all of us as a family. But because I was so sick, there's something in the military called the Exceptional, Exemptional Family Members Program, which is for um, people who, soldiers who have ill spouses or children, to where moving that family across the country or even to another country, if that's you know where the orders are, would be detrimental to that family because of whether it's because of specialists that are already where they're located. Familial support has a lot to do with it and a lot to do with um, me because my family was here and Josh's family was here. Um, those, those applications are not easy to be approved because if they were easy to be approved, a lot of people who didn't want to be stationed would go that route. They would use it as an excuse. I can't, I can't, my wife's sick, I can't move, right? Um, they go through very, um, rigor. A lot of doctors have to sign them. A lot of people in the military have to sign them. It's a process. Um, I applied when we found out. I applied for that because I was like, how am I going to do this? If you get stationed. Um, and I was approved. And we didn't have to move. So they had to reroute another family to go to San Diego to take Josh's place, our place. Um, a lot of stuff had to be moved around. It's it's just, it's very intricate, you know. So that was why we didn't move to San Diego. I had health insurance. Josh was already being compensated for me, for being married to me. Now, how does that, how does that fall into disability? Well, here is what I was told. Here's what I think. I was told in the beginning, back when I was in pain management, by my doctors, 
you know you should apply for disability, you can apply for disability. Then, but I didn't. And the reason I didn't was because to me, it seemed very greedy. And it seemed greedy because my needs were already being met by the military for 10 years, okay? Now, for anyone who pays taxes to think, well, you should have done it anyways, that's very interesting because your tax dollars are not only supporting everyone on disability and welfare, but they're also supporting the military and their families. That's the civilian tax dollars pay to take care of the military's families to, to, for, to protect your country, right? That makes sense. So because tax dollars are used to pay for disability and military, to me, that seemed like a very greedy move to ask for more money just for being set, just for being sick when my basic needs were already being met, all of ours were. And it wasn't until Josh, when Josh moved out, I started the process of applying for disability and there were a few more conclusive tests that I needed. Because when you apply for disability, you have to really go through rigorous testing to make sure there's nothing else that could happen. And I was scheduled for a 24-hour polysomnogram. I was scheduled for a couple of different things. And COVID hit. And I lost a lot of my appointments. A lot of non-necessary medical testing was um, put at a halt, kind of, like on hold, because of COVID. And we were all in lockdown. And nurses were being used for COVID and you know there were there were lots of reasons we all remember what happened um and when that happened my all of the testing that I needed and even just a lot of my regular doctor's appointments were canceled or moved back to a point where they were eventually canceled and COVID was weird because we they were what were they like two weeks to stop the curve and then we're on lockdown for two years and there were doctor's appointments. So I tried to reschedule and I couldn't. Um, and a lot of times, there was a couple of times it was because they were recommended. It was like a, what is it called? They were referred from like a neurologist or another doctor and the referral had like expired or something. Like it was a whole thing. So COVID hit. A lot of my stuff was put on hold. And people were still wearing masks when I was made homeless from this annulment. After COVID hit, it was after COVID hit that Josh started going really hard um, when Jennifer found out the stuff about my previous divorce. And Josh started going really hard for this annulment and the stress was more intense than anything I've ever experienced. Very, um, it was devastating, it was really hard. And I didn't cry about it online. I didn't really, I don't know, like I, I really try to downplay the severity of my physical health when other people are around, when I'm speaking to other people, which doesn't really happen very often anyways because I'm kind of stuck at home a lot um, because I don't want people to remember me as this sick, sad girl that, because that's not, I don't feel like that's who I am. I feel like I have a lot of light to bring, you know, and I don't want it, oh, my illnesses to overshadow who I am. I don't think I should be required because of this virus and what's going on with my body to be this sad, horrible person and leave that imprint on people. I don't, and I don't think that's fair to do that to other, everybody has their own problems. You guys are all have your own problems. We all do. Putting my stuff on other people seems selfish. And it just seems so unfair. I don't want people to remember me like that. That's There will be a time when, we're, when none of us are here anymore. That's life. People die. It happens. Um, and what 
the legacy that we leave behind is really going to be how people feel when they think about you. I believe that. Um, so now, probably, I'm trying to think of when I moved in here, not this past summer, summer before, once I got into a home, so grateful for Eric to allow me to stay here, and um, I have been taking steps to, to apply for disability, and that, and that will eventually be something that happens, I'm sure. I don't see a cure coming anytime soon. Um, I've tried lots of different medications. They all look different, and usually it's kind of putting a Band-Aid on it. Even if they help for a little bit, they don't usually help forever. Um, but now there is a situation with Medicaid and social services that I don't want to get too into at the moment because of other things. But even though I'm so sick, I'm having a difficult time getting benefits, even SNAP benefits. There's someone in social services who is very well aware that I'm speaking out against him in particular. And the last time when I was reapplying for my Medicaid and SNAP benefits, it was a nightmare. My file got moved and lost several times, which never happened to me before when I was applying for SNAP stuff. Um, and then there are other things going on that it's very corrupt. And I'm really just trying to um, stay my course and stay as positive as I possibly can. I beat myself up for so many years over this body and it makes me sicker, so I try to just be very grateful for my waking hours. I try to be very grateful for what I have that is nice and soft and good in my life. And I hope, well, I know that inside of me my gratitude overshadows my disappointment and discouragement. Yesterday, I post that picture of me just being in bed feeling horrible. And there were so many people who were so nice. And I didn't see it till today. The, all the comments. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back and, and respond. Um, and that kind of gratitude is... I'm just so grateful. Because it's not fun when you have to miss out on just existing. I mean, just, just even to exist. When you sleep, when someone sleeps, think about it. sleeping is great, right? It's relaxing, it's refreshing, it's rejuvenating, it's necessary for to survive. Because <laughs> that's when your body is recovering from all the damage you've done while you are awake. But when it takes over your life in a way that caffeine doesn't help, medication doesn't, there's nothing you can do. It's not so relaxing. It's anxiety inducing because every time you close your eyes, you're missing out on yet another moment, another memory to exist. And um, the fact that people were able to take advantage of my physical situation to take my kids is a heartbreak just on top. It's a devastation and tragedy on top of something that's already heartbreaking that I already have had to learn to adapt to and accept. I mean, even criminals in actual prisons get to see their children. They still get visits. And murderers still get to talk to their children. Um, Josh Duggar... I don't know if you know that the Duggar family was like the family that I think it was like TLC that had a million kids, whatever. And I'm going to be talking about them when I talk about my video when it comes to grooming. I'll talk about that a little bit. One of the oldest son, Josh Duggar, Google this, was convicted as in prison now for what the judge described as some of the worst child pornography. I don't like saying child, like it just it sounds gross, but 
like, just even saying that makes me very, so uncomfortable and so, like, just disgusted. Um, for, like, 10 years, he's in jail right now, and there are pictures of him getting visited from his children in prison, and I haven't been able to see or hear my children's voices in two years just for being sick, which is something I have no control over. It's not behavioral. It is very much physical. So many people do not understand that. I understand that it's hard to understand, but to use that as an excuse to bully me and take advantage of that is one of the most disgusting things I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot of disgusting things. We live in a disgusting world. Um, but I do want to talk about my disability. And I saw a comment under the picture that I posted yesterday that said, if there's anything I can do, please help. And I love that. That makes me feel so much less alone. I love those words. The unfortunate truth is, though, there really isn't. I wish there was something that someone could do to make me all better. Um, there isn't. I haven't. Not that I see. Not that, you know. There's not much I can do except try to live as healthy as I can. Like I said, water is so important. I try to stay very hydrated. Um, and I take my vitamins and try not to put a whole bunch of nasty stuff in my body. <sighs> I wish there, I know that there are people who like would help. But this is one of those life situations where there isn't. There's there isn't um, but I love the support and how much that means to me I can't express in words considering all of the horrible things that I've been told about myself that I've heard about myself that weren't true to hear kind and soft words like that is almost immeasurable in my heart and I am so grateful for anyone to just take their time out and say, hey, how can I help? Because even if you can't help, knowing, hearing someone say that is immense. Is immense. And I'm just so grateful. I wanted to make this video. I wanted to talk about this a little bit more. Um, I'm glad that I did. And I actually started to try to record this earlier outside. And I got distracted and had to stop recording. And in that video, I go off on a tangent about um, the fog that I that I experience a lot, that a lot of chronically ill people experience. I don't know if fog is a strong enough word, but I tell a little story about how when I first started getting sick, there was a situation at CarMax that ended up incredibly embarrassing. It's incredibly funny now. Um, and so I might go back to the video, even though I didn't get to finish it, and just clip that part of that story and post it separately. <laughs> Because it, um, it, was, it was an experience. And, and to this day, it's, it happened because I was sick and not thinking. But the results of what happened were a type of humor that you just also cannot put a price on. Um, but I just want to thank everyone. I started a... <coughs> I hear my voice going. I started a t-shirt shop. Um, with a lot of things having to do with this case. I'm going to link it below in the Facebook. When I post this to Facebook, I'm going to link my GoFundMe below. Um, and I appreciate every, any, any bit helps. I'm every, I hate asking people for money. That was another reason why my nonprofit did not do so well monetarily because I don't like asking people for money. I just wanted to help. I didn't, People don't realize that running a nonprofit, a lot of it is asking people for donations and money. That's how you run a nonprofit. Nothing is free. You still need money to run those things. I am not good at that. I just wanted to help people. I didn't, it wasn't a cash grab. It was never meant to be a cash grab, which is good because I'm not good at cash grabs. Um, I will link the GoFundMe below and um, my shop and, and, the, and the YouTube channel. So if you haven't been able to catch up on the other videos, you can. In the next three videos there was a development in in this case with my children and it made me realize how much faster I need to do this um, that 
things are a little bit worse than um, I even anticipated. So, a couple of the videos I was going to get into are going to be cut off and we're going to just jump right into it because there are things that need to be put out there. The next video is we are going to talk about the restraining order that Chris filed, my stepfather filed, um, against me. And I'm going to be reading that word for word. But before I read it, I'm going to tell you what actually happened. Okay. So you'll be able to very clearly see the differences. The video after that, my plan is to go over the email that I sent to my lawyer of all of the lies about me that were never addressed that are in court documents. And then the video after that, we're going to go over the parental capacity evaluation that I was so excited for originally because I thought, finally, I'll be able to talk to someone not biased. I'll be able to talk to a professional therapist, like someone who knows their shit. Um, doctor, doctor, you say doctor, she, I, I hope she's actually a doctor. She uses that title very freely. Um, but I put that in quotes because once we go over the, we're going to go over word for word, the parental capacity evaluation, you'll see why I'm air quoting doctor. Um, and then the next video, I want to talk a lot about grooming. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the Jody Hildebrandt case. We're going to talk about the Duggars again. And I want to talk about actually Britney Spears' sons a little bit because I feel like her situation happened for 13. My situation has been happening for two years. Her situation happened for 13. And it's a good it's a good example of what can happen when you remove a parent and when parental alienation, which is 100% child abuse, takes place. No shade to those boys. No shade. I see a lot of people online saying nasty things about them, like Britney supporters saying nasty things about her sons, like, well, this happened to her and they should understand. Okay, well, while, well, yes, one of them, I think, is 18 now, they're working with a lot of faulty intel that has been ingrained in them for years. So it's hard to put that blame on them. We're going to talk about that. Those are the next four videos. Thank you so much for watching. I just... My... I'm trying... I'm not that emotional. I don't want that. My gratitude... For anyone even just listening for a minute, anyone who has anything nice to say, like, I don't take any of that for granted. Once again, I am very well aware that everyone, you all have your own lives, your own problems, your own issues, everyone does. So to even dedicate even five minutes to me, um, I just, it fills my heart fills my heart and I just want to say thank you everyone um, all of you so thank you and I'm gonna try to get these next videos out as quickly as I can probably won't record again tonight because this is emotional and I want to be able to gather myself before we get into the next one thank you so much um, and I just appreciate all of you thank you